Hi there and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast and today I want to look at the beginnings of anti-communist hysteria in America after the Second World War uh, and the role that Harry Truman has to play in it and I'm going to be drawing from mainly an excellent book by David Coate uh, who if you've heard what I've had to say previously on the subject of um, the, the interwar fellow traveller movement I've drawn a lot from his writing. Um, David Coe points out uh, that there was nothing new, really, in the um, anti-communist um, shift in post-war America, and that there was, in fact, very little new legislation. There was a significant amount of it already on the statute books um, long before um, the anti-communist era. Two world wars and uh, an interwar period where political extremes were ever more greatly uh, observed and regulated had given the American government many of the tools it required for um, a post-war crackdown. David Coach writes, When Harry S. Truman became President of the United States on April 12, 1945, the federal and state statute books already bristling with anti-communist legislation. All that was required, and conspicuously lacking under Franklin Roosevelt, was the will to enforce it. Two years after the passage of the Foreign Agents Registration Act in 1938, the government had roused itself to prosecute the Daily Worker, International Publishers and World Tourists Incorporated for failure to register with the Justice Departments as agents of the Soviet Union. A year later, the administration invoked the Alien Registration Act, universally known as the Smith Act, against 18 Trotskyists of the Socialist Workers' Party. The Smith Act partly uh, part of the company with the honour tradition that only actions should be punished. Henceforward, words, even thoughts, could cost a man his liberty. But after the United States and Russia entered the war side by side in 1941, the Democratic administration was understandably reluctant despite the palpable eagerness of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, to persecute American communists. Indeed, indeed, Earl Browder, General Secretary of the Communist Party, was amnestied and released from prison. So, um, what this tends to uh, su- suggest is that when you see, um, or when there are historical periods, such as the McCarthyite era, which really stand out very clearly as extremes uh, um, or extreme deviations from an otherwise democratic norm. Uh, What we've got to see is that those those seemingly aberrant episodes haven't um, emerged overnight. It only appears like an aberration because we haven't seen or kept an eye on the gradual drift away from liberal democratic norms. Um, the Smith Act, uh, as uh, David Coke points out, um, breaks away from the idea that only actions should be punished. The conditions of the Cold War, of course, allowed all these uh, anti-democratic processes to to exacerbate. Um, Harry Truman, who was quite a different character from Roosevelt, and was far more uh, assertive in his approach to dealing with the, the Soviet Union uh, and far less inclined uh, to to compromise, it was exactly the, the right sort of president for uh, anti-communist policies to, to flourish under. Truman uh, came under increasing pressure from uh, an anti-communist coalition in Congress of Southern Democrats and anti-New Deal Republicans, who had the anti-New Deal Republicans particularly 
believed that the Roosevelt era um, had seen uh, the menace of democratic socialism emerge in America uh, in the guise of the New Deal. Though in reality, the New Deal failed to establish uh, anything like what would be considered to be uh, a European standard of democratic socialism in terms of commitments to full employment, universal health care, uh, the mass provision of state housing, that sort of, of thing. Um, the reality really is that Roosevelt was no democratic socialist, really. He was a pragmatic capitalist looking to use, into, use the state to intervene in order to save um, free market capitalism from, from itself. But the anti-New Deal Republicans had a belief that America had come under this socialist onslaught and that now the world situation had changed and there was uh, an even darker socialist menace uh, overseas. Um, uh, the, this um, coalition of the Southern Democrats and the anti-New Dealers uh, ganged up on Truman and on July the 2nd, 1946, the House Civil Service Committee uh, appointed a subcommittee to investigate the loyalty of all federal civil servants, um, which prompted Truman, um, after a Republican midterm victory in November, to demand his own uh, temporary commission on employee loyalty. So, all of a sudden, um, in peacetime, a, a very kind of aggressive and assertive and suspicious culture has seeped into Washington, questioning the, the loyalty of um, federal um, appointees and federal employees. On July the 6th, 1946, the McCarran Rider to the State Department's Appropriations Bill uh, allowed the Secretary of State to have powers of summary dismissal, um, and to have absolute discretion, and the Secretaries of Navy and War had declined, they had um, gained these powers during the war. So during peacetime, a civilian um, branch of government, the State Department, gained the same powers for summary dismissal as military branches of government had during the war. The suspicion of subversion and the fear of subversion um, dominate this period. Uh, for example, on June the 10th, 1947, the Senate Appropriations Committee wrote to George Marshall, um, who had been Roosevelt's Chief of Staff of the Army during the war, and also Secretary of State um, there, thereafter, um, and claimed to him that the State Department, in, in the State Department, there is a deliberate calculated program being carried out not only to protect communist personnel in high places, but to reduce security and intelligence protection to a nullity. Now, this wasn't entirely untrue, in that there were communists uh, within the State Department, and indeed, as later intelligence decrypts would show, there were Soviet agents uh, as well. Um, however, there is also some evidence to suggest that a great many of these uh, individuals had been known about for some time, and they were part of the process of having a back channel to Moscow during the war. The kind of language that was used was that these men and women were dangers to national security, that they were subverting the nation and uh, threatening America uh, with its, for its very survival. Of course, all this is, is pretty far-fetched stuff. Um, the David Coates writes, The 80th Congress of 1946-47 to was a bitterly reactionary one. Representative Claire E. Hoffman uh, of Michigan, a uh, Republican, explained that from the day that Mrs. Roosevelt appeared with a group of communists before the Dyes Committee, the New Deal, and more recently the Truman Administration, has been coddling and encouraging communists who in federal positions thrive on the taxpayers' dollars. So, again, there was an attempt to create this notion of continuity between Roosevelt and Truman, and the, the, the New Deal and uh, Truman's later um, social policies under the, uh, the, the Fair Deal would um, in some way be associated with, with communism. 
And there is this standard refrain that you can hear it all the way throughout American politics and British as well, to be to a great extent, um, of um, the of, of socialists um, or people with socialist views being indulged uh, on the taxpayer's dollar that they that the hard work uh, of the ordinary man is going to pay for these unpatriotic figures somehow. The language of political discourse is is very extreme in this period of time. I mean, we've become accustomed in the last few years for uh, political discourse to become so hyper-partisan and so hyperbolic um, that it's sort of one, one, one almost kind of ignores it now. But, for example, in, on June, in June 1946, the Republican National Committee Chairman, B. Carol Reese said that the, the next election would offer a choice between communism and republicanism, uh, which was really saying it would offer a choice between the Democrats and the Republicans, and the, the Democrats are kind of co- or communism is kind of code for the Democrats and vice versa in, in this way of looking at things. The justification for this view was um, since the policy-making force of the Democratic Party um, was now um, really allied to the Soviet Union. So <clears throat> this gives us a clue as to why Truman decided that he would appear to be so much more belligerent towards the USSR. He knew that his predecessor, Roosevelt, partly due to expediency and perhaps partly due to a bit of naivety, had really uh, allowed... Um, Stalin far too much leeway during the Second World War, and that now the Democrats could run run the risk of being forever associated with communism and, and all uh, the violence and cruelty that uh, appeared to to go with it. Another Republican lawmaker, the House Republican leader Joseph W. Martin, said. The people will vote tomorrow between chaos, confusion, bankruptcy, state socialism or communism and the preservation of our American life. And in those simple terms, many uh, American voters were um, shown that communism was really antithetical to Americanness. Whatever Americanness was in 1945, it was something fundamentally different to to socialism and this has been a kind of a an article of faith in America um, for much of the post-war era um, though not obviously embraced by everybody. Um, uh, David Coach writes in the Wisconsin senatorial campaign Joseph R. McCarthy accused his democratic opponent Professor Howard McMurray of being communistically inclined so for a largely talentless politician uh, like McCarthy, who had found it very difficult to uh, ex succeed in his political career, latching on to a convenient stick to beat the opposition with, uh, and using language that was spoke in stark, simple and emotive terms of Americanness being good and communism being bad, eventually helped his career immeasurably, in fact helped his career far more uh, than his own uh, fairly mediocre talents did. Essentially, between 1945 and 1946, the Southern Democrats uh, and the Republicans learned that red-baiting works. Another congressional candidate uh, in California, Richard Milhouse Nixon, um, said... A vote for Nixon is a vote against the communist-dominated PAC with its gigantic slush fund. So there are all these um, ideas that uh, the communists uh, secretly siphon off money, that there are communists, um, that the Democratic Party has been so compromised by communists and so taken over by communists that it essentially is a communist party. Uh, and that somehow they are sitting on large piles of, of cash, really for their, their own use uh, and their, their own corruption. All of which is patently ludicrous. But it was extremely effective in um, congressional and senatorial races across America 
the um, accusation of communist connections was um, deadly to political careers and paid off handsomely for the uh, accusers. Um, the uh, politician, um, the Republican Harry Kane, um, managed to become a senator and Homer Jones, a former state commander of the American Legion, um, swept out Congressman Hugh DeLacy in Washington, who had been the Democrats' um, left-wing choice um, for the seat. The 1946 election was, uh, the midterm election, was a, an overall disaster for the Democrats. Um, but it was a lesson that the Democrats also learned that red-baiting would work. Um, the share of the House to the Democrats fell from 242 seats in 1944 to 188 in 1946. Um, and this had been um, a, a, such a decline from 1936, where they'd had 331 seats. Um, the candidates who uh, were supported by the uh, CIO uh, PAC um, won 75 of the 318 uh, races that were, had been entered. And this was uh, partly to do with public apathy, uh, but also due to outright public hostility. And the Democrats lost 10 million votes in 1946. So uh, there had been, clearly something had changed at the end of the war um, across uh, America, there had been a dramatic shift away from having not only um, left sympathies, which were obviously a very minor thing in, um, in America, but centre-left sympathies. So um, the idea of uh, really continuing to have a, uh, any sort of celebration of the wartime alliance with the Soviet Union uh, it goes falls by the wayside, but also um, a deep suspicion of the uh, the New Deal, even for those who benefited significantly from it. Uh, ironically, it's in 1944 that the most important act of uh, state intervention and state largesse, um, the GI Bill of Rights, was introduced that managed to ensure that an entire generation of men returning from the war had very favourable circumstances in which to restart their lives. This, obviously didn't fall into the overall picture of kind of apathy towards left-wing ideas, but certainly uh, it could definitely be seen as being a, um, a, 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 an act of um, social democracy. So after 1946, Truman was playing catch-up with the Republicans and trying to uh, steal their thunder. He signed Executive Order 9835, which um, initiated a purge of um, the Federal Civil Service, and um, it inspired uh, other purges at every level of American working life. The, um, the president, as this is David Coat writing, the president himself later confided to Clifford J. Durr that the loyalty order and its accompanying heresy index the Attorney General's list, was designed mainly to take the ball away from the House Committee on American Activities and its uh, 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 under its pugnaciously reactionary chairman, J. Parnell Thomas of New Jersey. In March 1947, uh, there were demands that the Communist Party of the USA should be uh, banned as they were inconsistent with the, the notion of uh, Americanism um, and other initiatives at a, both a, an executive and a grassroots level um, involved, for example, uh, public officials taking anti-communist speaking tours across America, engaging um, uh, listeners in um, taking freedom pledges and singing God Bless America. Um, in From September 1947 until December of the following year, there was a, a red, white and blue freedom train that was sponsored by the Attorney General Tom Clark and the American Heritage Foundation, which toured the country. Um, the uh, American Civil Liberties Union um, report for 1946-47 said that 
there was now an atmosphere increasingly hostile to the liberties of organised labour, the political left and many minorities. Excitement bordering on hysteria characterised the public approach towards any issue related to communism. So certainly um, there had been a, uh, a particular climate, a particular environment created that would support this sort of um, mass panic and outrage and, and anger. Tom Park, um, the uh, aforementioned uh, Attorney General, was desperate not only to deport um, political undesirables, but also to expand the role and the authority of the FBI. The Communists, he informed the Chicago Bar Association in June 1946, are driving law enforcement in this country to the end of its tether. Uh, he cited as an example the previously uncodified crime of uh, conspiracy to divide our people, to discredit our institutions and to bring about disrespect for our government. David Coates writes, When Clark and uh, Gerhard, um, had Gerhard Eisler arrested on February the 4th, 1947, two days before Eisler was um, appear, due to appear before the HUAC, the House and American Activities uh, Commission Committee. Um, the Attorney General again revealed his personal conception of law enforcement. I ordered Mr Eisler picked up because he had been making speeches around the country that were derogatory to our way of life. Clark's department used the deportation weapon against a large number of pro-communist militants and trade unionists who were embarrassing the administration by making speeches derogatory to its way of life. Yet Truman later denounced the deportation powers of the Walter McCarran Act of 1952 as thought control. Truman, ever the arch hypocrite, um, was determined to present Republican red-baiting as uh, undemocratic and unconstitutional. But um, hopefully, as we'll see in later podcasts, his own uh, attacks on the American uh, left and uh, left-wing critic, uh, critics of him, particularly from the trade union movement, um, was only seen as, as him putting uh, Uncle Joe, as he put it, in his place, um, uh, putting you know, dangerous communism um, back where it belonged. OK, well, that's uh, just a, a brief... A brief taster of um, the McCarthy era, and it's a theme I'm, I'm keen to pursue. So we'll be coming that, back to that fairly soon. But uh, anyway, I I hope you found that interesting, and I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. Do support us through Patreon if you can, and I look forward to speaking to you all again soon. Bye.